I would love to hear the voice of heaven, or love to hear God's voice speak directly to us from heaven, wouldn't you? Wouldn't that be something? Um, I hope we would be able to endure the experience because it might be a little bit frightening. And if we could get past that part of it, I'd really like to hear it. It would be something to do. Um, that's always a, a curiosity of mine that I've had, and maybe you share that in common with me, and maybe you do not. But for those uh, who do, we're going to satisfy that curiosity in this hour. And what I mean by that is, is we're going to go back to the very beginning where we find God's voice actually speaking down from heaven at the creation. And as we do so, of course, we're rewinding the scene from where we stand today. We're roughly six millennia, uh, give or take a, a little bit. But I ask you to stay with me because there's going to be a lot of history and a lot of background in this lesson. But by the end, we're going to pull it all together and try to figure out what in the world does this mean for us 6,000 years later. But let's take our minds back to Genesis chapters 1 and 2 and let's allow heaven's voices to speak down to us to see what it is that they have to articulate to us. As we do that, we're going to find voices of absolute certainty. Have you ever thought about that in relation to the creation? I'm going to give an expanse of text. I'm not going to state these verses as we go through. However, they are listed on the screen. And we're going to go down through verses 3 through 14, and I want you to notice what God says in each one of these events, each one of these days. God said, let there be a whole bunch of things, right? And on different days. And He, he says, let there be, for instance, light. Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters so that it will divide the waters from the waters. Now this firmament is a, a heaven which is nothing more than a space. It's an expanse. And there's going to be waters above the expanse or the space and there will be waters below the expanse or the space. Now the waters that are going to be below it are going to be nearly exclusively liquid and solid. But those above are going to be in a gaseous state Nevertheless, there are water, the water is found in different forms above and below, and there's a, a space. And that's what God said anyway. Verse 9, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered into one place, and let dry land appear. Let there be lights in the firmament to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs, seasons, days, and years. Let them also be to give light on the earth. We're familiar with these words. But there's not really a lot of him hawing around in the creation of the world as far as God speaking, is there? There's not any... Well, I think there ought to be light. I'm curious, though. What do you think about that? There's not any... I've always wondered about putting a space between waters, but now I'm second-guessing that. Could you give me some input on that? No, God knows absolutely what He wants. That's the sovereignty of God's will. He's sure what is best is that... He doesn't really have to think through the process. He already knows everything. And so he speaks it, and that's just the way it is. Well, that's kind of the way it works with the Lord's will for us today too, right? There's not any him hawing around. It's not, well, I'd really like this, but this might be okay also. There's not any, well, I thought this originally, but after you brought something up to me, let me second guess that. No, it's, that's the way it is, and that's what we find out from this voice from heaven complete certainty there are no questions about it well these voices that speak from heaven they show us a tremendous amount of power it's not just the fact that these things were spoken to be done it's that once they were spoken they actually came to fruition we look at these same verses with one exception seven although it's referring to the same event as in verse six and god said let there be light and you're not going to believe this <laughs> there was light God said, let there be a space or a firmament and divide waters from a liquid and a solid state and a gaseous state. And yeah, it was so. God said, let the waters under heaven be gathered into one place and let dry land appear and boom, it's there. God said, let there be lights in the space, the one above that even, outer space. And to divide the day from the night, let them be for signs, seasons, days, years. Let them give light on the earth. And yeah, that's really the way that it unfolded. Isn't that something? Wouldn't you like it? Anytime you wanted something done, all you had to do is just say it. And, and like that, it took place. Folks, that's the power that we see in, in heaven's voices that were uttered at the creation. 
They know what they want. They speak, and immediately that's what gets done. But perhaps most impressive of all, these voices from heaven tell us that life can be produced from non-life. We look back at Genesis 1, and this time verses 11, 20, 21, 24, and then parts of 26 and 27, where God says, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb and the fruit tree, and it was so. And I know that doesn't sound like a big deal to us because 6,000 years later, hindsight is twenty twenty. but can you imagine if there wasn't a blade of grass, not a single plant, and not a tree, and because some voice from heaven said, let there be these things, immediately they came, and really from nothingness, not very far back. I like the way Hebrews chapter 11 puts it, that by faith we understand that the things which are made or physical things were not made of things which are visible, or in other words, non-physical things. <laughs> that's, how can you do that? Well, that's just the power of the voice of heaven and its decisiveness that has life which issues forth from it. Verse 20, God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature and the fowl, the birds that fly above the earth. At one point in time, there wasn't a, a single living entity in the waters of this place. There wasn't anything that was going through the sky, but some voice from heaven said it, and just uh, within seconds, the waters teemed with life, and the heavens were full of birds that were flying. Sure enough, God created great whales and every fiend, uh, winged fowl. God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature, cattle, creeping thing, and beast of the earth. Do we understand why it is that we have life on this planet that moves around on the ground? Well, the reason for that is because some voice from heaven said it and dirt sprang up life from it. <laughs> And it didn't even take millions of years for it to happen. It took a few milliseconds. And the life was there. That's the power of heaven's force. It's life-giving. Now, that's all neat in itself, but we're really getting to something here in verses 26 and 27. We just sang about it a moment ago. And God said, let us make man. And in one day, you have the human body formed in the way that it exists today. Now, that's something, isn't it? Yes, these voices from heaven, they know what they want. They're full of power. There's tremendous life that is contained within them. And they really don't have to be, but for some reason they're just so kind to all of the creation and especially that final part about which we were just talking. We can see the generosity of God looking back at verses 26 and 27 more in, in their fullness. When God said, let us make man in our Image. It's interesting, isn't it? The, the plural terms uh, that are used there, and there are a couple of ideas concerning it. I don't think this is just some respect for, for sovereigns that, that's used as one concept is that floats around. Uh, but what makes a, a lot of sense, kind of like the man and male and female, a multiplicity of one kind, uh, so also with God you have a multiplicity of one kind, not multiple gods. The term just means divine nature or deity, and there's only one of those. However, there is more than one being. Each who equally possesses that one nature of being, the divine one. You don't ever find God taking counsel with angels as to trying to figure out what He's going to do. <laughs> Rather, He speaks to fellow divine entities, saying, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And sure enough, verse 27, God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. We also find it's not just the male gender, but it's male and female. He created them. We're not going to deal with that right now. But ladies, we're not about to skim over that all-important fact. We're going to come back to that at the end of the study. Male and female were made in God's own image. I don't want this to be misunderstood, what I'm about to say. I'm not, I'm not trying to stand before you and claim that God's a female, okay? Please don't understand it in that way. That's not what I'm suggesting. But I'm also going to say that God isn't a male in the sense that we understand physicality and what it takes to be a, a, a male in this life in a material way. That's not a reference to bodily anatomy 
whenever masculine pronouns are almost exclusively, though not entirely that way, used for God. In the New Testament, we have some neuter ones that are used of Him as well. There are some reasons for that. But but God isn't male in the sense that we understand a physical male to be. I realize God came in the flesh and lived as a male. But even in Jesus' transformed body, He doesn't have the physical anatomy of a male that we would think of a material male to be. And the reason we know that in part is because female was made just as much in the image of God as what male was. There's some instance, some way in which both the male and the female gender possess the very likeness of God. I'd like to know more about that, wouldn't you? I'm interested to know what exactly that is. Well, we really don't find this out until the second chapter of Genesis where the creation of man is told a little more uh, intimately in verse 7 when it says that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. All right, well, there we have it, right? That man is made in God's image. Man was made out of dirt, therefore I guess God's dirt. Is that what's being told to us? It's really interesting that the term that's used for man and the name that's actually employed toward him, uh, Adam, now I'm not good at Hebrew, okay? And so please don't criticize my pronunciation, but I believe it's along the lines of Adam, That's not a translation, but a transliteration of the term Adam, Adam. It's closely related to the word back in chapter 1 and verse 25 that's used for the earth, Adhamah. Does that sound similar in any way? Adam, Adhamah. They're basically the same words, just with a few letters difference. And what this tells us, it reminds us of the lowly origin of man. That man, the, the animal side of him is no more than dirt of the ground, uh, just like the cows, uh, just like the horses, just like the goats, and and just like the sheep. And so humanity started at at a really lowly place, nothing more than dirt. It expresses the essential frailty of man. All we are in our composition, the physical side of us, really is, is little more than dirt. And just as God could pick up or just blow and move some dirt across the ground. He can do with us too if He wants to to move us. (laughs) Uh, We're nothing compared to Him and His infinite strength. It also has to do with the eventual destiny of man. From dust we came, and eventually to dust we shall return. Well, that doesn't sound very impressive, does it? But there's another word from this verse that I want us to discuss, and, and that's the term formed, and that is pretty impressive of itself. This is a word that is used of a master potter who would sit at the wheel and he would take nothing more than wet clay and yet from his artistic genius, he would mold and he would form that into something really impressive. And that's what God has done with the human vessel. And composition, we're nothing more than dirt, but we're wet dirt. Uh, It just so happens that our bodies are comprised roughly of three-quarters water. (laughs) So we're wet clay. (laughs) And so in the creation, you have God with dust, and He combined a whole bunch of water. And then as the master potter at the wheel, He took that which really is not impressive at all, and He made something really impressive out of it. You recall what David says to the Lord, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Yeah, the human vessel is really impressive of itself, but it's not really because of what comprises us. It's because of who made us. And so the emphasis and greatness in Genesis 1 and 2 really isn't on man's intricate design as much as it is the masterful designer, the genius potter who's behind the wheel who who took wet dirt and really made it into something impressive. So is that what's intended for us here? Is is God communicating to us that we are made in His image not just because we're dirt, but because God, He's really impressive. He's wet dirt. I think He's more than that, don't you? Let's continue on in in verse 7 of Genesis 2. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and He breathed into His nostrils the breath of life, and that's when, where, and why man became a living being. Now we're on to something. This is different right here. The animal creation also was formed, same word that's used, by, by an artistic genius potter, 
was formed from the dust of the ground, the dirt was made wet, and God, in His infinite wisdom, made that into something really impressive. But you'll never find this statement about the animal kingdom that God infused into those creatures the breath of life. Uh, in Hebrew, this is a unique composition to humanity. And whatever it was that God infused within people, it caused this animal vessel to become that which is beyond the animal kingdom and to be something very impressive made in God's own image. It's something that gave this animal vessel life. And that's not why the animals live, because they don't have this within them. What is that thing? In math, there's something known as an additive inverse. And an additive inverse is the opposite of, of a number. And it's really simple. Uh, if you don't know what no, one number is, but you know what its additive inverse is, say, for instance, 14, uh, well, the opposite of that has to be negative 14, even though you don't know anything else about it. Uh, if one number is negative 3 and you want to know the opposite, well, it's easy. It's 3, even though you haven't seen that number yet. Well, the same is true in many other factors of life, and, and not just in math, that if we don't understand one thing very well... If we could get its opposite down better, then we can actually go back to better understand that thing. And for instance, if we don't know what it is within man that gives this body life, if we know what the opposite of that is which produces death, its absence, that tells us what the presence is as well as what it does for the body. And here's why I say that. Notice what's said in James 2, verse 26. As the body without the spirit is dead... Now, the purpose of this is to teach about faith and works. We're not doing that. I don't know if... Maybe we're using it a little out of context. For that. But there, there's a good illustration, though, that's used. Faith without works is dead. And here, here's a truth God gives to illustrate that fact. The body without the Spirit is dead. What does that mean about the body in relation to the Spirit when it's present? You see, the opposite has to be equally true. If in the absence of the Spirit, the animal vessel is dead, the presence of the Spirit means the animal vessel is alive. And so that in which God infused man, the breath of life is alternately known elsewhere in the Bible as the Spirit. And there's a reason that remark is never made of animals and because animals do not have a Spirit within them. And that's how God made us in His own image, even though He didn't have to. That's what makes us unique in comparison to the rest of the creation. In fact, that's what makes us superior to the animals and as well the plants. That's also why God has put us in charge of all of those things. Verse 28 of Genesis 1, And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Brothers and sisters, we don't serve the animal creation. They serve us. And there's a reason for that. They are inferior to us. Not because of anything we've done, but because of what God has done. God didn't make us for the animals. He made the animals for us. But that's equally true of the rest of God's creation. Verse 29 says, God speaking, Behold, I have given you every herb, bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, and the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for food. You realize what that means? If I'm hungry and I see some pieces of lettuce, I'm going to make a salad. And I have every right from God to do such a thing. He has made it for you and for me in that way. I don't serve that lettuce, and nor should you. <laughs> that lettuce serves us. Fruits and the vegetables serve us. I don't serve a tree. The tree serves me. That's the way God has made it. Well, but why is that? Is that really fair? Because after all, you look at the plant life that exists in this place, you consider the abundance of animals that are found, whether on, on land or that are in the air or that are swimming in the water, and then you compare those alongside humanity. Don't we all have things in common? Yeah, we have some things in common. And our commonality is this, that all of these elements are alive, but they're not equal. 
And the reason for that is what God infused into man that He did not put into plants and what He did not put into animals. And some of it's a little bit common sense, really. It's true that plants, they're alive just like animals, but unlike animals, plants are unconscious. Animals are different than plants because they have consciousness. Uh Uh-oh, don't we have a problem? Because when we compare ourselves to animals, now we have those two things in common. (laughs) That people are alive, animals are alive. People are conscious, and so are animals conscious. So does that mean we're equal? Now there's still a difference between the two. It has to do with the level of consciousness. Yes, animals are conscious, but it's only humanity in God's creation that is self-conscious. And what I mean by that is it's only people that have the ability to rationalize and that don't simply act out of instinct. Now, we can do that. In fact, there are references to that in Scripture. They're acting like nothing more than brute beasts, God will say. (laughs) And what He means by that is they're acting like animals simply out of instinct and they're not using their brains and their intelligence that I instilled within them from myself. The difference between animals and people, is that people should consider and have the ability to do not only what my urging tells me to do, but also what is right and what is wrong. And so I ought to act on that basis and not simply some animal urging that exists within me. And that's the difference between humanity, animals, and plants. Folks, God made us very special. He put something within us that is not found in either one of those two. He put us in charge of of both of these as well as all other matters on the earth because we are the reason that the earth was made and not the other way around. We see the generosity of God continue to spill forth in the second chapter of Genesis in verses 15 through 17. Where the Lord God took the man and He put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Uh, God did not want His people to live without a home. And so the first home that He made for man is quite literally a paradise. I'm going to have some of this in in the lesson tomorrow, so I'm not going to deal a lot with this in this one. But it's really interesting, the construction of what this place is called, the Garden of Eden. A garden from the Hebrew gone is actually an enclosed or a hedged garden. Uh, many believe by that that it's intended that it's a place of, of, of protection. Okay, um, I want you to consider maybe some gardens that, that you viewed when you traveled around that have been created for what I would call tourist traps. <laughs> Uh, that are beautiful, and maybe you pay even to go in and to see it, and, and it's just like paradise almost that, that it looks like. Have you ever seen anything like that? Eden. The name means pleasure. And so when you piece it together, in the Garden of Eden, you have an enclosed or a protected pleasure garden. A place where the environment is, is so enjoyable that you don't even have to put on a jacket at any course or at any point in, in the year. Every tree that is pleasant to see is found there. Every tree from which is is good to eat is located in that place. It appears that there were were gardens. Maybe those were the first pets. We have all the first in the book of Genesis. The first pets, perhaps, even, that that Adam and Eve got to enjoy. It's mentioned that there's this, this spring that bubbles up out of the ground and that there's so much volume to it that it creates not one, not two, not three, but four river heads. Just think about some of the gorgeous springs that you've seen. This state has many of them in the southeastern portion of it. Actually, one of them, I understand, is one of the largest in the entire world. Big Spring, that's creative in the Ozarks. (laughs) Big Spring is what it's called. But as large as that is, it only pours into one river. Can you imagine a spring so beautiful and so large that it forms four different rivers? And this is what humanity had pouring out of their home. You know, people uh, build pools at their house or they have them put in and they'll have these fountains running down. (laughs) That's essentially what Adam and Eve had in this place. It was a perfect place to call home. Quite literally, it was paradise on earth. 
And God is so generous. He wants humanity to have the opportunity to enjoy this forever. And He says, I only have one rule for you. You see that tree right over there? Okay, look away from it. You don't want anything to do with that. It's no good. Stay away from its fruit. As generous as that voice from heaven is, as powerful and as life-giving it is, it almost sounds like he's, he's pretty certain when it comes to sin, doesn't it? He says, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely, notice not, you might die, or even probably it will turn out bad for you, I guarantee you, it will be your worst nightmare if you touch that stuff. As loving, as kind, and as generous as God is, because He's also that, He doesn't play around whenever it comes to sin. And He says that we're not supposed to be playing around with it either. You stay away from that stuff. I'm sorry for doing this, Clint. I'm just going to allude to your lesson Okay, all right. I won't even do it because he's upset. So. <laughs> now, I, let, let me just say this. I'm not reading a verse from it, okay? <laughs> That's an important adverb. Surely. Uh, when Clinton gives his lesson, I want you to consider an adverb that this entity adds to that. And, and I'm just going to say this, that, that I'm quite confident that what he's trying to do is get humanity to doubt the certainty of God's will. He doesn't say you will not die. Probably, maybe, you will not. Surely. You can't really count on it to be that way. Because the voice from heaven is so generous and, and, and that voice just seeks to produce death within us. The voice from heaven strives to produce life within us. He knows what His will is and He's adamant whenever He presents it to us. God has been so good to the male gender. Ladies, He's been awfully good to the female gender as well. And I believe this is observed in Genesis 1 and 2 as much as it is about the man, if not even more so. And here's why that's so impressive. In the ancient creation myths, there is zero attention that's that's paid to the creation of woman. The ancient creation myths, they don't talk about the woman being created. But God spends ample time in discussing the woman who was created, both in Genesis 1 and and two, and he does that from antiquity back way before it was popular in 21st century America. Verse 18, The Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. If you don't believe this to be true, you leave a man who's married by himself for a weekend and go check his home at the end of those three days and see what it looks like. <laughs> it is not good. <laughs> that a man should be alone. By the way, I don't believe this is intended to be for all males everywhere uh, because we know what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7 and the way he led his life. And he actually he says, I wish that all people were like I am, unmarried. And he says, but each one has his own gift from God. Some can do that and be okay. Some really struggle. I'll tell you, I'd be one of those who would really struggle if that were the case. I hate to see where I stand today the way it is. I'd really hate to see where I stand today if it weren't for my wonderful bride and and the help that she's provided me over the the last more than a decade now. God looked at Adam's personality, and and he knew it was a personality like mine, maybe a personality like yours. It's not good that this guy's alone. (laughs) I'm going to give him some help, and I'm going to make a woman to do that. When we look at the term helper or helper, we might think that that would connote uh, someone who's inferior, somebody who's less qualified. Maybe someone who's not as intelligent as the other one. I would be careful about drawing that conclusion concerning this word, though, because elsewhere in the Old Testament, this term, helper, is used of none other than God Himself in relation to humanity. This does not point to ignorance, and it does not point to weakness or a lack of qualification, else God would be all those things to us. And we know that He's the reverse, and and we're the ones who are all those things in regard to Him. Rather, it, it points to wisdom. And it points to strength. You don't find any conversation about the woman and, and creation in, in this regard in, in any other account but the Genesis 1. <laughs> because God loved and He treated woman as an equal from the beginning in creation. You recall what we read? It wasn't male simply who was made in the image of God. But it was just as much the female who was made that way. He lifts her up on a plane of equality 
with the man. And, and truly, a, a woman who decides to be married to a man and, and the man to the woman, that woman actually ends up producing a godlike function to him, providing strength and help and wisdom in his life. So to make this happen, verses 19 and 20, out of the ground, the Lord God, He formed every beast and fowl. He brings them to Adam and says, hey, what do you want to call these things? And so Adam gives a name to each one. All the cattle, all the birds, all the beasts of the field. But he recognizes, and I think God's doing this purposely, that for him, there was not found a help meet for him. None of these were suitable to be his life companion. And so God's going to help him out with this in verses 21 through 24. The Lord God causes a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and he closed up the flesh then in its place. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And the man's pretty delighted by this. Adam says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Well, it sounds like it's all the rest of, of creation. But if we go back to the original language, there's actually something stated here about the woman and her formation that's not about all the rest, including the man. There's a unique verb form that's used for her in her formation that isn't spoken about any others. This verb literally means to build. And actually, it's used in other places in, in Holy Writ to refer to unfinished structures. And I believe what God is communicating through His terminology that He uses by inspiration is before He makes the woman and brings her to the man, man is an unfinished product. He's not what He needs to be. He's never going to end up into who He needs to be. And He needs some help, He needs some strength, and He needs some wisdom to get Him to that point. You can make the case that God used more precious material to form the woman than He did the man. For the man, all He used was dust. But for the woman, He uses dust double refined. He uses something that was made that was already impressive, and He takes it and He makes it into something, in the very least, equally impressive. I wish I could give credit for this where it's appropriately due. I've done some searching, and, and the latest part I can find, or the earliest I should say, is, is with the renowned commentator Matthew Henry. Maybe it's his original words, maybe it's not. Nevertheless, it's an excellent biblical observation how woman came from man's rib, not from his feet to be walked on, nor from his head to be superior, but from his side to be equal, under his arm to be protected, and close to his heart to be loved. Now, when God makes man, the home for humanity isn't yet prepared. And that seems apparent because twice it's mentioned how the Lord God takes the man who is made and he puts him into a place where he was not before, in the Garden of Eden. Not the case with the woman, but that the home is already prepared before she comes along. And so it seems that, that God has saved this part of his creation, maybe the best, for last. And he especially waits until there's a man who's longing for her arrival so he will appreciate her for all of her intrinsic worth. And so you see this generosity of God pouring forth not just for the male gender, but equally so for the female gender. And search all the ancient creation stories and you're not going to find anything like these things that are mentioned in relation to the woman. God cares so much about humanity, not just men, but equally so women. And he forms the first union between these two, Adam and Eve. And what we find is really the four components uh, that it takes for a marriage to occur. Uh, you have the father who's willing to give away his only unique child, as far as gender goes, with the woman. Uh, for some reason, the, the woman agrees to this. I don't think she knows into what quite yet she's getting herself. <laughs> Maybe that's the reason why. But she comes to the man, willingly does so. Well, of course the guy realizes he's marrying way out of his league. This is great, yeah. I'd like to have her. He gladly receives her. But before this can be a, a, real, a real marriage, the woman has to be willing to change her name. The man says she shall be called Isha because she was taken out of Ish. That's the Hebrew. And you can see that 
Isha has ish in it. Ish is the word that's used here for man. Isha, woman. That's a compound noun. It's the same thing with our English word woman. Have you noticed the ending of it? Man. It's a combination of two nouns that were brought together. We love to do that in English. We spliced them and we made them into one. Quite literally, woman is a man with a womb. Those are the two words. In other words, she is a man just with some anatomical differences. And that's what it took to make the first marriage. I want to tell you why I'm so thankful for this study. It caused me to look at at marriage in a whole different light than I ever had before. And here's why. I think I finally realize now why God gave us this relationship of marriage in this life. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul spends all this time talking about how husbands are supposed to treat wives and, and how wives are supposed to treat husbands. And then he gets down to the end and he quotes this verse that we just read at the end of Genesis 2. And then he says, this is a great mystery, but I'm really not talking about earthly marriage. I'm talking about spiritual marriage. And I'm using earthly marriage to try to get you to understand the relationship that God wants to have with us. I want you to think about this in in relation to Christ and the church. How does a true marriage work? You have a father who's willing to give away his only unique child. In this case, it's his son. And it's not the man here, but it's the woman. It's it's you and I, the bride, who realize, whoa, we're marrying way out of our league. Yeah, we want him. (laughs) And for some reason, even though he knows into what he's getting himself, he, the flawless one, takes a flawed bride so that he can be married to her. But before a, a real wedding can take place, the bride has to be willing to change her name. What is that name that was given to Christians early on? Those who, who follow Jesus, but just that itself? Christ is in the name. And we find in 1 Peter 4, I'm, I'm really not that interested simply in, in people calling you Christian, or you calling yourself Christian, but in your actually living as a Christian. It's not just a commitment of vocabulary. Rather, it's, it's a commitment of lifestyle. We change our names to Christ's name because we change who we are into His character. We also find in, in Genesis 2 that there are three factors that make up a, a successful marriage. You have to have a man who's willing to leave his parents behind. You have to have a, a man who's willing to cleave to his wife and a man who's willing to weave what would have been just his destiny into one with his wife's. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, be joined or, or cleave to his wife, and the two, they were separate, not anymore, but now their destiny shall become blended into one. If you like poetry, that helps, doesn't it? Leaving, cleaving, and weaving. Well, what's the significance, though, for us? I would suggest once more, it's really not about earthly marriage. It's about heavenly marriage and trying to get us to understand the relationship that God wants to have with us. What you have in in Jesus is someone who's willing to leave his home and his father behind. And the reason he does that, he comes to this foreign land searching for his wife to whom he can be married. And once he finds her, he pays the dowry for her, if you will, and he's ready to be joined to her and what would have just been his destiny alone now becomes his brides, together for all eternity. Do you recall what it was that Jesus told his disciples in in John 14? I know this is unfortunate, but uh, don't be afraid. I've got to leave you behind for a while. However, trust me, I will come back for you. And I will receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be connected in any way to his son because what was only going to be his son's destiny in regard to the two of us now is equally going to be ours whatever is going to happen with Jesus for all eternity now if we're his bride gets to happen to us for all eternity and I would suggest that was the significance of marriage and that's the importance of Genesis 2 all along I know it was 6,000 years ago and in a completely different age (laughs) But but as we look back on these words, you can almost hear the tone of heaven's voice speaking down to us words of decisiveness, words of power, words of life, and words 
of generosity that apply just as much to us in this time six millennia later as what they did back then? Are we willing to listen to those voices and what they mean for us in our time?